The Old Testament reading for the sixth Sunday after the Epiphany is taken from the 17th chapter of Jeremiah. Thus says the Lord, Cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength, whose heart turns away from the Lord. He is like a shrub in the desert and shall not see any good come. He shall dwell in the parched places of the wilderness, in an uninhabited salt land. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose trust is the Lord. He is like a tree planted by water that sends out its roots by the stream and does not fear when heat comes, for its leaves remain green and is not anxious in the year of drought, for it does not cease to bear fruit. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our epistle is taken from the 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians. Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain, and your faith is in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in this life only we have hoped in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I invite you to rise for the reading of the Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the sixth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus came down with them and stood on a level place with a great crowd of his disciples and a great multitude of people from all Judea and Jerusalem and the seacoast of Tyre and Sidon who came to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. And those who were troubled with unclean spirits were cured, and all the crowd sought to touch him, for power came out from him and healed them all. And he lifted up his eyes on his disciples and said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you shall be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you shall laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you, and when they exclude you and revile you, and spurn your name as evil on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day, and leap for joy, for behold, your reward is great in heaven, for so their fathers did to the prophets." But woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full now, for you shall be hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. Woe to you when all people speak well of you, for so their fathers did to the false prophets. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise Praise to you, O Christ. Christ. Grace and peace to you from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. You know, as an observer of, of a lot of funerals over the years, and certainly a been a part of many funerals over the years, there's, there's a couple of trends that I've noticed. I pay attention to not just what's happening, you know, maybe here, but, you know, I talk to funeral directors, you know, what's going on in the, in the business. I read articles sometimes, and here, here's a couple things that I've noticed, and uh, some of that's even, you know, affected our life together here in some ways. Here's, here's one that um, it's actually become less likely over the years that when you go to a funeral, uh, the body of the deceased will actually be there. And there's a couple reasons for that. One of the reasons, one of the recent reasons is COVID. Um, in fact, not only is it uh, less likely maybe that the body of the deceased will be there, uh, sometimes over the course of COVID, it was true that it was less likely that people would be gathered for the service itself. Sometimes we, we watched from afar, watched from our uh, homes, from computer screens and the like. So that was one thing, but even before that, but also as a part of that, some of this is is the result of of more cremations now than than really ever has been the case uh, throughout uh, at least my uh, my time as a pastor uh, in the ministry. And so obviously, if there's a cremation, um, instead of a a body in a casket, well, there'd be be urns and ashes, right? Now, now ashes are indeed uh, the remains of the body, And we even reference that uh, at the graveside with the words that are used, earth to earth, dust to dust, ashes to ashes, see? But but actually, this has also been a part of this trend that even urns in ashes are less likely these days 
to actually be at the funeral service. In fact, did you know this? That more and more, the very word funeral is avoided by folks. They don't want to use that, that term. Preferring something like maybe a celebration of life. Have you noticed that? Sometimes you go to a funeral and it doesn't say funeral anywhere, maybe on the bulletin, uh, but it says a celebration of life. And, and sometimes I've even been asked, uh, I haven't been asked uh, here, uh, but I've been asked before years ago. I remember a uh, family told me, we, we, don't, we really want to avoid talking about death. <laughs> we want to remember life. We want positive memories. Say, anything wrong with good memories? No, of course not. That's a part of the, the process of grieving. But we also want to remember this, that even the best memories, even the best memories cannot remove from us the sting of death. There's only one who can do that, and that's Christ. Now here's the other trend. It sounds like it's the opposite of the one that I've just been describing. And boy, I'm really glad that this is not caught on in Kansas. I hope it never does. Um, but it has caught on in some regions in, uh, in our nation and different parts of the world. And wh what this is, it's the practice of posing the body of the one who has died at the you know, funeral or celebration of life or whatever it might be called as though the person were still living. So let me give you, these are two actual cases. There's many, many more. I mean, look it up on the, on the interwebs. You'll find some examples of the same thing. But here, here's a guy, he, uh, he died. He loved to play poker. And so what they did is they, they sat him up at a poker table with a bunch of poker chips in front of him. And then what the, what the family and friends did is they gathered around, they sat with him, and, and they played poker. Now, he didn't play. I mean, you might say his chips were already cashed in. But everyone <laughs> gathered with him, and, and, and they had, you know, presumably a good time. Here's another one. Uh, this, uh, this lady, her name is Miriam Burbank of New Orleans. That, that's one of the regions where this, by the way, has really caught on. And what they did with uh, Miriam is they set her up at a table and they had her favorite beer right there and a package of smokes. And uh, then they all kind of gathered around. And here's what her sister said. She says, it's like she's not dead. It's not like a funeral home. It's like she's just in the room with us. Except she wasn't really, was she? Now here's what strikes me about these two practices is that on the one hand they look like they're opposites, but on the other hand, they're really just two sides of the same coin. What's really going on here is these are both attempts to avoid being confronted with the reality, with the sorrow that comes at death. It really does take away from us the living body of somebody that we love. Isn't it wonderful to be a child of God with a better hope? Yeah, with an eternal hope. With the, with the promise of God in Christ that we have the assurance of a resurrection. That's what our text today in 1 Corinthians 15 is about. By the way, that is, uh, that's one of the places that we go in Scripture when we're thinking about what happens when, when, when we die and what is next when Christ comes again? This is, this is the chapter on the resurrection, other places in Scripture, but, but 1 Corinthians 15 really brings it all together for us. And what Paul is doing in these, these verses of our text is he's responding to a report that he has received from some in the church in Corinth that there were those in the congregation who did not believe in the resurrection of the dead. So verse 12, Paul asks the question, how can some of you say there's no resurrection of the dead? Now more literally, he doesn't just say sort of a general word for the dead, but actually what he says is something more like this, more literally, dead bodies. How can you say there's no resurrection of dead bodies? And so they were rejecting in some way the teaching that on the last day, when Christ comes again, that the very bodies of the dead will actually be raised up to life again. Now where in the world do they get an idea like that? Well, where do we get crazy ideas from that, that affect our faith? From their culture, that's where they got it from. And so some in that day, uh, Greek and Roman philosophers, uh, taught that, uh, hey, um, this life is all there is. 
We might say that they were materialists. They just believe in the material of this body. There's really nothing more to us than this, just the electrical, chemical impulses, biological uh, things taking place. But once you die, that's it. When you're dead, you're dead. There's, there's nothing more. And there's plenty of people in our world today that actually have that view towards life, that this life is really all that there is. But there were plenty of others in the ancient world, in fact, really most others in the ancient world, believed that there was some kind of an afterlife. They believed in what we might term the immortality of the soul. So when you died, right, your body was dead, but that was the end of the body. There was no more, no more future ever for that, but the soul would live on. And it appears that that's what some of the folks in, in the Corinthian church had come to believe. And it's still what many people in our culture believe. You know, if you go out there and ask, you know, average Joe on the street, you know, what do you think? Is this life all there is? Some people say, yeah, this is, this is it. But a lot of people actually think there's something more. There, there is an afterlife. But is there an afterlife for the body? See, that's, that's really the question. And sometimes it seems, even in the church, that we forget, maybe momentarily, the Bible's promise of a bodily resurrection. And Paul wants to correct us in this. Sometimes at a funeral, um, you might have heard somebody say, and I've, I've heard people say, maybe looking into the casket, or maybe as a family gets together and plans for, for a funeral service, they might say words to the effect, you know, let's say it was me. Well, you know, Jim isn't really here anymore, and this, it's just Jim's body. In fact, sometimes maybe you've even said something like this to your family, maybe seriously, maybe kind of kidding around. Hey, I don't care what you do with me when I'm dead because I'm going to be in heaven. So you do what you want. Well, what's usually meant by that? When we talk like that, we say, what we're saying is our souls live on. And that's absolutely true. Thank God for that we're acknowledging there's something more to us than just our bodies, right? There is a soul. But to say that there is something more, that there's a soul that we cannot see, does not mean that what we do see, right, the body, is something less. Or, or that the body is somehow less important to God or, or to us. The reality is the bodies of those we love are very precious to us. Isn't that true? And that's why when somebody we love dies, that last, maybe last touch, last look, maybe beside a hospital bed, maybe, maybe in a funeral home or in a church before a casket is closed, that can be so important to those who grieve because the bodies of the dead are precious to the living who have lost them. Okay, but now listen. You know what the resurrection means? It means that those bodies are precious to God for eternity. And isn't that wonderful for us to know? At a Christian funeral, what we're saying is this body is going to be raised up on the day when, when Christ, our resurrected Lord, comes again in glory. Now, is it going to be different? Well, it's going to be perfect. It's going to be a perfected body. It's going to be a, a healthy body. It's going to be an immortal body. All of that is, is true. It's going to be a sinless body. And yet, at the same time, it's going to be the same body in some sense as that body which we lay in the ground. There, there's an old spiritual that says, ain't no grave going to hold this body down. You see, that's a recognition. This body is going to come out. Just like when Jesus was buried in the tomb, it was that body that came out. And Jesus... Uh, goes to lengths to make sure that his disciples know that. So what Paul is telling us here is if you deny that the dead will be resurrected, you're actually giving up the Christian faith. He's actually saying if, if, you, if you deny the resurrection, you're actually not a Christian. That's what he says. He says, for if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. You hear the argument. See, if, if dead bodies don't get raised, what that means is the dead body of Jesus didn't get raised. And if Jesus wasn't raised, 
well, we got no salvation. We're still in our sins. As Christians, sometimes when we think about the salvation that Jesus has won for us, we sort of limit it, maybe not consciously, maybe we're just not thinking it through, but we sort of limit it to what he did for us on the cross, the sacrifice that he offered for us there because of our sin. And there's no question that that is at the very heart of our salvation, for sure. Romans chapter 4, verse 25 puts it like this, he was delivered over to death for our sins. But it's not only by his sacrificial death that we're saved also by his resurrection so that same verse Romans 4 25 it doesn't only say Christ was delivered over to death for our sins it immediately follows that with and he was raised to life for our justification and so by by raising Jesus to life one Jesus is showing that he was victorious over sin and death and God is revealing to us and to all the world that the full payment for our sin has been made and therefore we're set free from sin and death. The debt's been satisfied. We're righteous, we're justified in the eyes of God because of Jesus and all that he's done for us. Well, what this does then, what, what this great truth that we find in Scripture does for us is it gives us an opportunity to consider what sorts of sins against the teaching of the resurrection are we called to repent of in our lives? And, you know, taking into account Paul's frustration with uh, those who had gotten uh, the understanding of the resurrection wrong, uh, we might say that, that we're also called to repent of those times when we've been ignorant of what God's word actually teaches either about the resurrection or, for that matter, anything else that God's Word would teach us. And the reason why is because we've allowed ourselves to be influenced by our culture, perhaps, rather than Christ, or just by our own, uh, our own fancies instead of that which Christ has actually given us as truth in His Word. So, so if, if we don't know what the Bible teaches, what happens is we open ourselves up to all sorts of false teachings that rob us of eternal truth and eternal comfort. Remember that family that I mentioned just a little bit ago? They, uh, you know, set their, set their loved one, uh, this, this woman, uh, up at a table with her favorite beer, her pack of smokes and the like. When they did that, did it help them remember her? Yeah, sure. They captured something evidently of her personality, the things that she liked. Did it help them grieve their actual loss, her absence? more important, did it help them reflect on why the loss? Why wasn't she really there? Because of sin. Because the wages of sin really is death. Not, not just for her, for them, and for us as well. That's the, the reality. But most important, did they know, did they hear what Jesus Christ did to overcome sin and death? Hearing and believing what Jesus has done that rescues us from ignorance. It rescues us from, from hopelessness. Did you know that's why we say the creeds? The Apostles' Creed, Nicene Creed, and the like. That's, that's why we hang firmly onto the doctrines that Scripture gives to us. I remember reading an article one time. It was in the religion page of the Waco Tribune Herald. And it was by a pastor, and I, I can't say that he wrote much of anything that was... Uh, really worth reading or comforting. But one of the things that was especially not worth reading and not, uh, not comforting at all is he said, you know, um, doctrines and creeds are not supposed to be hitching posts for our faith. He said, we ought to use them more like signposts. I guess a signpost, what he meant by that is kind of point you sort of in, the, in a general direction. But, but actually the creeds, <laughs> And the doctrines of Scripture that they proclaim and that, that, that we repeat, yeah, they are hitching posts for my faith. You know, you know if your cowboy rides up to the saloon and, and doesn't hitch his horse up to the hitching post, the thing might run off somewhere. No ride home. And, and if I just, if I don't have my faith tied down to something true and solid and, and real and biblical, I'll go off in any kind of direction. I'll get like a recalcitrant mule that doesn't want to stand firm in the truth. And so, yes, we need to be tied down to the truth. Now, the Bible's teaching about the resurrection 
can also remind us to repent of all of our sins against the bodies of people who are living all around us. What do I mean by that? Well, think about it. When we don't really take care of the poor who are physically suffering, when we're not remembering the sick who are suffering in, in the body and doing what uh, we might be able to do uh, to comfort them, when we don't protect human life in the womb, when we don't care for those in nursing homes and the like and just sort of uh, tune them out of our lives, what we're really doing is we're, we're denigrating the resurrection of Jesus by which he declares to us how much he treasures the bodies of those that we're tempted to discount or despise or, or forget all about, even dispose of. Here at Mount Calvary, one of the things that often happens is when somebody is, is sick or going through a crisis, um, CIA kicks into action, care in action, that, that, uh, that group. And many of you have participated in that. You've helped provide a meal for somebody. Why are you doing that? Isn't it because we're concerned about even the bodily needs, the concerns of people in our lives that we love? See, that, that, that's a way in which we are actually affirming people are important to God now and forever. Most of you uh, were here when we had that video clip up just a little bit ago about value them both. And what we're saying is that the, that the life of a mother, the body of the mother, and, and the life and the body of the little child within her womb, that's important to God. And he actually has an eternal purpose for the bodies of those whom he loves. Everlasting life in the body, see? You know, it's not only the bodies of others that we sin against. Sometimes we sin against our own bodies. Paul brings that up earlier on in this same book, back in chapter 6. He says, don't you know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit? And so we can think about what, what unholy, what unwholesome actions in our lives sometimes reveal how little regard we have for our own bodies for which Jesus sacrificed his. And if we won't repent of any of these things, what makes us think that we would have a share in that sacrifice? And yet, praise God, when, when by his word he brings to us an understanding of, of how we have sinned in all kinds of ways, it's against our own bodies, against, against the bodies of people all around us, against his body, because all of our sins were laid on him. When we acknowledge our sin and admit before him in sorrow, you're right, Lord, I'm a sinner, Thank God you have given yourself for me. Then how grateful we are that Jesus assures us he did die for us. He did whatever our sin, and he rose to life again, though we so little deserved it. Isn't that wonderful? Really, isn't it? I know that my Redeemer lives. What comfort this sweet sentence gives. How come? Well, because it means that those who have died in faith will rise again. It means that, that right now, as I live out my life, as I struggle and as I fall at times into my own sinfulness, I have a Redeemer who assures me he was sacrificed for me and you and for all who rest in him. And because of that, we shall surely rise again. Amen. I invite you to rise now. May this word keep you steadfast in the true faith until life everlasting. Amen. Let us now confess the second article of the Apostles' Creed and speak together, the section of Luther's small catechism that tells of the redemption we receive from our Lord Jesus Christ. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. What does this mean? I believe that Jesus Christ, true God, begotten of the Father from eternity, and also true man, born of the Virgin Mary, is my Lord who has redeemed me, a lost and condemned person, purchased and won me from all sins, 
from death and from the power of the devil, not with gold or silver, but with his holy precious blood and with his innocent suffering and death, that I may be his own and live under him in his kingdom and serve him in everlasting righteousness, innocence, and blessedness, just as he is risen from the dead, lives and reigns to all eternity, this is most certainly true. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, your kingdom has been made manifest in the preaching and miracles of Jesus Christ. Gather together your great multitude from every Gentile nation and from Judea's remnant, that many may know wisdom come in our flesh. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Grant, O Lord, that your people may always hold fast to the word that's been preached to them and not believe it in vain. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Preserve the family and all godly Christian homes. Give parents diligence and persistence in their duties to teach the faith and word and example. Keep all children in the promise you made to them in their baptism. Let the patience, kindness, and endurance of Christian love have no end among us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O Lord, do not let our rewards and blessings consist in the treasures and goods of this world. Give us joy in every sorrow, knowing that if we have you, we lack nothing, and we'll receive an eternal reward in Christ that cannot fail. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Be near to those who are troubled by any unclean spirit, memory, or thought and to the sick and all who need your healing, especially Jim Schoenbeck, Don Hankin, Thomas Day, Scott Julian, James Myers, Colette Smith, Ben Owens, Deborah Thompson, Anita Statz, Ron and Harold, John Morbido, Ron Aaron, Marilyn Walker, Renee Batt, Roger Shercolt, Brianna Hoffman, together with others that we name before you in our hearts. Send forth your power in the name of Christ Jesus that they would hear your word and be cured. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Bless all who trust in you and come to eat the holy body and precious blood of Christ for the forgiveness of their sins in the blessed sacrament. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. O Lord, your Son is risen from the dead and has promised that he will only be the first fruits from among those who sleep. Preserve us in Christ Jesus with hope beyond this life. Comfort those who mourn, especially the family of Louise Daler, with the certainty of Christ's resurrection, and let us live in confident expectation. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We entrust all these petitions to your care, loving Father, confident in your great mercy, for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who is worshipped together with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Amen.